Good evening and welcome to the new school. My name is Karen Kooni. Uh, I'm the director of the Viralist Center for Art and Politics and on behalf of the center and Parsons, the new school for design, the new school for social research and Eugene Lang College, the new school for liberal arts. I'm delighted to welcome you to this panel called The Oil Spill. In July, when we conceived of this, of this program, the notion that the deep water um, horizon oil spill may constitute the greatest man-made environmental, environmental catastrophe in the US was a given. We had been glued to our screens, watching the oil plume rise through the seawater for many, many weeks, and we knew that something utterly disruptive had occurred. This, we were certain, would change how we think about energy dependence and environment, about infrastructure and systems, about accountability and the legislative process. In the time since, the spill has become much less visible. With its media disappearance, the charge has become that much more urgent, therefore, to begin to understand what happened and to examine or even plan for some of these um, adjustments or changes. What we're trying to do tonight is simply acknowledge the disaster's breadth and uh, reach by looking at some of the very obvious aspects of it, such as the immediate effect of the environment, for the environment, and at some of the less clearly connected uh, uh, items, uh, such as vi visualizations of the spill or even fashion, what could be called the costume of disaster. The panel coincides with a series of programs on speculation that is organized by the Viralist Center, and I'd like to invite you to return to a talk by artist Inigo Manglana Ovalle on climate change next Tuesday, and a week later we are um, hosting Peter Gallison, uh, who will deliver a lecture on wilderness and wasteland. Creating tonight's program has been an opportunity to draw from many different divisions at the New School, and I would like to very much thank the panelists who will walk up to this podium one after the other as they gave their presentations. I'd also like to thank Joel Towers, the Dean of Parsons, very much for agreeing to moderate our conversation tonight. And in particular, I'd like to thank Vicky Haddam and Shana Agit of Jaina at Parsons, Vicky at the New School for Social Research, who together with me conceived and planned the program. At the Verily Center, I'd like to acknowledge Annie Shaw and Julie Snavely, and of course, T uh, Pam Tillis, Director of Public Programs at the New School for General Studies, deserves our thanks. The structure of tonight's panel is quite rigorous, each speaker has exactly five minutes to deliver a succinct uh, and condensed pronouncement or statement about more or less one detail of the spill. I'm sorry to say that one of the speakers um, became sick. Cameron Tonkin Wise is not joining us, um, but now I'm pleased to welcome Joel Towers, who will give a brief introduction and then, as I said, moderate the discussion afterwards. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Karen. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for um, always organizing some of the most interesting events at the New School. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I, I guess I've been asked to moderate a panel discussion among eight, uh, nine individuals with eight presentations. I'm not sure that's actually possible. Um, but I will do my level best to, um, to make sure that we have uh, I'm not sure, well, I don't know, a civil discussion about this? Do we want to have a civil discussion about what's in front of us? I, I'm reminded of the fact that, and maybe I shouldn't admit this in public, but um, many nights during the spill, I would just look at this thing before going to sleep or when I couldn't sleep. Um, it, it was so mesmerizing and terrifying um, while it was happening. And yet I'm kind of, um, I'll just say a couple of words of introduction about this disaster, which is uh, how incredibly predictable it was. And I'm not really quite sure that it constitutes a disaster if it's predictable. This is sort of a question I guess we have to ask ourselves and maybe we'll get to that tonight. But there's absolutely nothing that couldn't have been predicted about the fact that this would happen. Uh, and you know, just if you look uh, back over the course of the, the last uh, a couple of decades at the number of oil spills um, that have occurred around the world, um, it's really not a question of if these happen, but 
um, just where, which will be the next place uh, where an oil spill like this will occur. And so in a large sense, I think we're talking really about the landscape of acceptable risk more so than about disaster, which is to say that we simply accept in our culture and our society these kinds of events. Um, in fact, we build them into our landscape of risk. It has to be done in that way. Um, if we're to understand them in any other uh, sense, um, then we need to be, begin to change the question of what that landscape of risk is. Uh, I, I would put this in the context of certain kinds of uh, discussions that are going on, and I know last night there was a bit of, bit of a uh, discussion around climate in relationship to uh, these issues, and if you put this in the context of climate change, I think the same kinds of issues uh, emerge, which is simply to say that um, the time horizon of risk events and the kind of risk events that we um, accept based on the society that we have constructed in this way, uh, is of our own making and is very much tied to um, how we understand uh, um, the challenges in front of us in terms of what we will accept. So for example, I, I often talk about 100-year storms, and I think that's a very important time frame, um, this being a kind of perfect storm event. Um, but the 100-year storm is precisely that kind of acceptable risk level that we associate with all sorts of decisions in society. Um, we, it's, a, it's a time frame that we go to uh, because it, I think, um, because it exceeds any individual human lifespan. Um, but if you start to change that risk factor and you bring it back down into 50 or 20 or 10 year cycles, which is what's happening with the changes in the uh, natural environment, and you say, well, every 10 years we're going to have a storm that's going to wipe out a significant portion of some local uh, locality, is it acceptable anymore? And I think we don't look at these kinds of risks in that way for some reason. We don't look at oil spills from that same risk horizon assessment, because they do happen every five, 10 years. And, and there have been some, I don't know, what was the number? Somebody added it up recently, almost 800 million barrels of oil spilled since 1978 in just the top 10 spills. So we get very focused on these events, and yet they are, they are part of a landscape of risk that we have built into our structure of being. Um, we're doing the same thing, or we'll likely do the same thing around nuclear energy um, if, in fact, uh, the shift uh, toward um, away from carbon fuels toward nuclear power as a way of addressing uh, uh, carbon in the atmosphere is the primary vehicle, and it's split the environmental community right down the middle, more or less, to say that nuclear energy, because it's carbon neutral, is an appropriate form of of energy, but the risks associated with that are not unlike the risks associated with what we see here. The same people who will tell us it's okay to drill and it can be managed in this context are the same people who will tell us it's okay, we can store the waste and we won't have accidents at nuclear facilities. So I think, for me at least, and I'll introduce the first uh, discussant tonight, but um, the very question of risk is at stake and how we construct risk uh, and what we accept as uh, viable. Um, or desirable, uh, but I don't necessarily call it a disaster. So I'm curious to see who, uh, what, how we go today. Um, Karen has given me an order of presentation which I will um, follow and be, and she's going to keep time, I'm told, so I don't have to do that, which is great. Uh, and I, I will introduce each person uh, very briefly. Their bios are in your, um, are in your uh, books, and so I don't want to uh, take time for that. Uh, and I will start with Vicki Haddam, um, who will speak about image effect in time and is from the Department of Politics at the New School for Social Research. Vicki? I've got to be able to see these lights. Don't start yet. I want to wait. Can I get the plume yeah, back? I can't see the film back. I'm just going to do the plume. Yeah. Okay, I want to talk tonight about the politics of the Gulf spill. I want to try to explore the politics visually by contrasting two sets of images, which have a shorthand for me of the oily bird and the plume. Both sets of images have been in broad circulation. Is this loud enough? Have been in broad circulation. And both have been used to, to convey the magnitude of the spill, but they do so very differently and with very different political effects. Let me start with the oily bird. I had a couple of images that I was going to show, but it's with a short time frame. I'm just going to hope you can bring them to mind in your imagination. Um, 
like these. Um, but these close-ups of oil-colored birds and many others like them convey the weight of the spill, revealing the environmental damage at a human and animal scale. The politics that follow focus on how to respond to the damage. I think of these photos as enacting a post-human identity politics, if you will, in which politics is framed in terms of injury and reparation. But it's the second set of images, uh, the plume that's been running um, as we've been settling into the room, that I'm particularly interested in. These are the images that will stick with me, the one that I found simultaneously in exactly the same words that Joel used, both mesmerizing and terrifying. They capture something about the spill and the current political moment more generally that the poor bird images do not convey. And I think the difference lies between these two sets of images in the contrasting conceptions of time and affect, by which I just mean feeling or emotion, that the bird and the plume convey. In the bird images, the injury is in the past. It has been done, completed, it's over. The plume is ongoing, there's no end in sight. It's future-oriented, the political consequences are still accumulating in a very rapid and open-ended fashion. It's the speed, volume, and openness of the video that conveys a different sense of political time, of an open-ended future rather than a closed past. And I think the affect and politics of the bird and plume are very different as well. The bird images evoke feelings of anger and blame. Who did this? Who should pay? These feelings are usually directed at someone, at someone in power, BP, Deepwater Horizon, Obama, Washington. Much of the political commentary around the spill has operated in this vein, whether it be Karl Rove suggesting that the Gulf spill is Obama's Katrina, David Brooks' New York Times op-ed suggesting that the plume has become a metaphor for the ineffectiveness of the Obama administration. Almost all the commentary focuses on the questions of accountability of some kind. The plume, though, generates a different set of feelings for me, centered around anxiety and fear rather than anger and blame. What's happening? Will it change? Will it ever end? And the anxiety is, is a diffuse state in which the emotions are not sharply aimed, not really targeted at anyone. It's the ability to tap into the diffuse anxiety and fear that gives the plume its political power for me. It both marks and helps constitute the current political moment as one in which things are out of control. It marks it in a more profound way, I think, than the Brooks op-ed allowed. Brooks saw the plume as a metaphor for the Obama administration policy failures. For me, it's a metaphor for a deeper anxiety that reaches well beyond the Obama administration to a diffuse yet pervasive fear that the American century has come to a close. On my reading, the plume taps into the same affect, the same set of feelings that Glenn Beck and the Tea Party are trying to mobilize. All three are premised on the sense that the, it's the end of our time, the end of the American century. I put the hours in quotation marks. And I have two bits of what I call sideways evidence that lead me to see Beck and the plume uh, in the same vein, as tapping into the same affective and temporal shift that mark the current moment as different from past decades. Any quick comparison of Beck and Ronald Reagan's references to Morning in America reveals the affective political shift, the feeling shift from the 90s, 1980s to the present. Take, for example, Glenn Beck's keynote address to CPAC, the conservative um, organization meetings that had its annual meeting in February of, of this year, in which um, Beck invokes Reagan's phrase of mourning in America that was used in his uh, campaign in 1984, Reagan's campaign in 1984. Beck returns to that, but when he does so, he quickly goes on to say, yes, it's mourning in America, but we're kneeling down on the bathroom tiles, head in the toilet, puking after the binge of private and public spending. On a more sedate mode, or in, a, in a more sedate mode, Beck refers to America as an old chair, loved, bent, saggy, and in need of repair. Throughout his monologues, Beck incites and seeks to capitalize on the se sense that America is uh, past its prime. Contrasting the two sets of images of the oil spill allows me to mark this political shift in affect and time. Attending to the temporal dimension of the images, to the way in which the plume foregrounds the future rather than the past, has also allowed me to understand an aspect of Beck's performance 
that has confused me for some time, namely Beck's constant reference to socialism and Karl Marx. Why continually bring up the communist bogeyman when the Soviet Union has fallen apart? After looking at the plume and thinking about political time, I think Beck brings up Marx and socialism not as a way to return to the oppositional Cold War politics of the past, but as a warning about the future that we might become them. Beck's logic has shifted, I think, from Cold War opposition to a politics of decline and identification with our former rivals. I've tried to use the oil spill images uh, and the relationship among them to affect and time to think about the plume in particular rather than the oily bird as the image that captures the anxiety and fear of hegemonic decline. Why do I think moderating this is going to be impossible? Um, Thank you, Vicki. Uh, next is Shana Agid, uh, whose title is I Wish to be Invisible, Watching the Oil Spill. Shana is a member of the Faculty of Art, Media, and Technology at Parsons. an instant transition. Um, so I'm going to start at the end with this image, which was actually compiled by a blogger using the final sort of shut down image of that image we were just looking at for some time when it moves by itself. Um, and, and using the freeze that was actually became quite popular in the media not that long ago, right, that the, the well is now officially dead. So I'm going to be talking briefly about this kind of cycle, the cycle from when this was nothing to when it became nothing again. Um, and really actually hearkening back to some of what I think Joel raised, which is when was it ever nothing to begin with. So um, there are many images that many of us become quite accustomed to. Um, and these images that I'll show now are from, um, and I don't know if they can be seen super well from the back. Can you guys see those? Um, they're actually from NASA. And NASA was in the process of um, beginning to be able to trace um, what are essentially natural spurts of oil that come up um, about three months before this spill. And when the spill happened, as they put it on their website, um, they just sort of kicked into high gear. Um, so these began to show through essentially surface reflection off the ocean, these kinds of swirly spaces where you're able to see the oil start to come together. Now, one of the things I want to talk about is the way in which the images that we saw and the, the length of time over which we saw them, right, five months almost, um, came to, began with, with this image of next to nothing and came to expand literally over the, the space of the Gulf, a space that many of us might not be familiar with but came to know through these images over and over again. So I watched this spill through another set of images over the course of the summer in the New York Times. And these images, if I can get this to stop for a second, um, these images began looking something like this. I don't know if any of you read the New York Times, but at the inset, in the beginning, in the, in the front matter of the paper, there was a small inset, and that inset actually, actually began early in the, le in the spill and followed the sort of visual accumulation of oil over the course of um, what was over 100 days. But interestingly, they have a 100-day snapshot, which I think, to Vicky's point, is, an, is a fascinating one. Um, the way that these images accumulate, they start with, um, again, nothing. And sort of in the middle, begin to map the currents. They begin to map um, oil, fl oil that actually has accumulated on the, on the shore. And they begin to show a sort of, um, albeit really quite pretty, uh, picture of um, kind of intense destruction. The very last image in this series is this one we're looking at now, which is from August, August 2nd. And it shows um, the source of leaking oil having dried up the remnants of a dead fishing area, so a closed fishing area rather, and the remnants of tar balls and other accumulation on the shore. Also available on their website is this image, and this is the 100 day picture. And so the 100 days start with nothing and end with nothing. And what I'm interested in thinking about is the way in which we are being asked to imagine that in some way, and I don't know that this is what the New York Times is getting at, but in some way, there's nothing happening here anymore, right? So it's kind of the classic, there's nothing to see here, folks. Move along. 
So on the days that the, the oil well was declared dead, I decided that I would do an even more incredibly unscientific way of thinking about what this looks like, that the, that the, that the well is dead. And so, as you can see, my Google image search was BP well dead. Um, and what comes up is actually lots of images of not so much a dead well, but a very much alive political debate. Um, there are several pictures of Obama looking consternated. There's an image that is enlarged there of a wave that is made at least partially of oil. And one of the things that, that begins to happen here is this debate around the capacity to envision the, the weight and the destruction of the oil itself. So what we begin to see here is a debate that starts to break out actually quite recently in the New York Times and in other, um, in a, in other media outlets about whether or not the fact that we can no longer see anything means that there is in fact not a problem. Now, the, we all know, or many of us know, that there has been um, a, uh, that there, there is a, that, the, that there's a, a way in which we prioritize the visual all the time. Um, BP now is beginning to actually take charge of what these images might mean for us by by featuring ads that show both their capacity to look for oil and their capacity to look at other things. Here we see a woman showing a BP employee what can maybe not be seen, which is money that is missing from that register. Together, and this is a, a final shot of the, um, if you go to the site where you, were, where, where you were looking for the oil spill, this is actually what you see now, this actually rather analog, kind of antiquated idea that we are past this, that it is over, that there is nothing left to see. And so I want to close by just saying that the, this has all brought to mind the, um, the way in which we privilege the, the danger in what there is, um, in what we see, and what we police. And it brought to mind this final image um, that we have been called, I think in many ways as Joel raised, we have been called to see. And we have been called to see in very clear, very politicized, very specific ways. In the work that has happened, or in the, rather the covers that has happened, or in the papers around this spill, and in particular in television around this spill, I think we are also being called to see. And in this moment, we are transitioning in a moment to being called to not see, right? And so the connection I would draw is not maybe the obvious connection between um, the theory that this presents, that there is a terrorist threat and we must, must watch it and be vigilant over it but rather what our being called to see causes us not to see so much of the time, and the way that the invisibility of things actually takes precedence oftentimes over the visibility of those things. Thank you. It's like we can't get rid of this spill. Um, the next up is Bhavani Venkantaraman, the, uh, who is the faculty at uh, Lyon College and the chair of natural science and mathematics. And she will speak about chemical dispersants and the oil spill and experiment in the making. So I'm going to switch gears a bit and talk a little bit about chemistry that's related with the oil spill. Um, on May 1st, a chemical experiment of unprecedented magnitude was launched. This experiment was not the kind that scientists typically perform. It was not a controlled experiment where variables could be systematically changed and outcomes analyzed. Instead, in an attempt to save shorelines, animals, birds, and ecosystems from being deluged with oil, BP decided to use chemical dispersants. To summarize the challenges posed by this decision, um, I'd like to read the opening of a news report in the August 13th edition of the journal Science. How BP came to spray 1.1 million gallons of chemical dispersants a mile beneath the ocean surface is a story of scientists turning to desperate measures during desperate times. And the government's decision to let BP do so, among the most gutsy calls of the entire Deepwater Horizon saga, was a classic case of pitting the devil you know against the devil you don't." End quote. So why were chemical dispersants used? As we all know, oil and water do not mix. Um, molecules mix or dissolve if they favorably, favorably interact with one another. In other words, there's an attraction or affinity for them, for each other. Water molecules strongly interact with each other, and an oil molecule cannot displace a water molecule from one another. So oil and water do not mix. Oil is said to be hydrophobic, um, going back to Chem 101. And since oil is less dense than water, 
It floats and forms a thick oil slick on top. Crude oil, as we know, is toxic to humans, to other life, to ecosystems. Oil spills have been responsible for the deaths of aquatic species, marshlands, and other ecosystems. Recovery of these ecosystems take decades, as the Exxon Valdez incident has shown. But what if there is a way to mix or disperse this oil so it is essentially broken up into smaller fragments and does not collect on beaches and marshes and cause the deaths of aquatic species, at least on the shorelines? That's where a dispersant comes in. A dispersant contains two components, a solvent and a surfactant. It is a surfactant component that is key to its role in oil spills. In fact, you use surfactants every day. It's what soap is. It's your everyday dishwashing or laundry detergent. So essentially, a dispersant works the same way that soap works to clean greasy dishes. If you have an oily plate, water just does not do the job. Oil and water do not mix. But a surfactant molecule is different in that it has both a water-loving section, a hydrophilic section in chemical terminology, and a hydrophobic section. So surfactant molecule interacts favorably with both water and oil, essentially bridging between the two. I'd actually hoped, if there was more time, to have a little bit demonstration here to show what happens when you mix soap, oil, and water. In any case, you could try that at home. Um, in winter, the surf sorry, in water, the surfactant molecules self-assemble to form closed structures called micelles. But the surfactant molecule is oriented with its hydrophobic section in the inside, away from the water, and the hydrophilic section, the water-loving section, pointing outside, so the micelle can remain dissolved in water. So if you add a surfactant to oil and water and you agitate that mixture, which is what happens every time you do your laundry or wash greasy dishes, the oil gets trapped inside of this micelle, and the, and the oil because the oil molecules can favorably interact with the hydrophobic part of the surfactant. Hence, a surfactant removes the grease from a plate, or in the case of an oil spill, breaks up the oil slick so that the oil is sequestered inside the micelle. Many of the dispersants that are used in oil spills are supposedly less toxic than the crude oil, so this would seem to be the lesser of two evils, to sequester away the toxic stuff and something that is less toxic. Dispersing the oil means that the oil slick will not wash up on shores, or at least not all of it. Birds, turtle, fish, mammals will not be covered with oil, plumes, oil films or perish, and perhaps ecosystems and marshes can be protected to some extent. Further, dispersing the oil effectively dilutes the oil over the ocean, and breaking up the oil allows for an increase in surface area to increase the, bi bi the decomposition of the oil by naturally occurring bacteria. However, while the immediate impact of oil washing up on shores may have been reduced in this particular case, perhaps that's why it's no longer visible. What is unclear are the long-term impacts. Is spraying the dispersant really the lesser of the two evils? What are the longer-term implications of these dispersant oil micelles? What happens when they get ingested by organisms? Do they bioaccumulate? What happens when they degrade? Do they degrade? Are they forming plumes? What happens to these plumes? The bottom line is we do not have the answers to these questions. We do know that if this oil was allowed to come onto shore, the damage would have been severe. Given this, how does one decide what action to take when there is one known outcome, and a very unpleasant one, and an unknown outcome? Science demands careful experimentation, analysis, and interpretation. But this takes time. What seems to be increasingly evident is that we're changing our planet in ways that science cannot quickly assess, nor make complete recommendations on how to address them or what alternative paths to take. Thank you. Next is Lopa Banerjee from the New School for Social Research Economics Department. Um, spilled vulnerable environment and vulnerable people. Um, what seems uh, to be most amazing as a uh, member participant of the audience is that coming from completely different disciplinary background, we are uh, pointing out to certain common factors. We are talking about risk and accountability and visibility and invisibility, uh, issues of power and control and order and absence of all of these things and this metaphor. In fact, um, my talk uh, is motivated by the main questions that uh, was mentioned over here. Um, the main questions were this. The oil spill is a man-made disaster that changed the Gulf of Mexico. Who do we make, uh, how do we make sense of this catastrophe? 
And the second question was, um, is the oil spill calling for a new consideration of systems that we depend on? These are the systems that we have depended uh, upon to protect us, uh, uh, to uh, keep us safe, uh, to make uh, the environment more resilient, to make um, economic system and other kind of social system more resilient. And so we are raising these questions of accountability. Now, I shall be addressing uh, these two issues um, through the lens of risk, interestingly, uh, and uh, of chance occurrences and of vulnerability um, analysis. And I shall try to draw the connection between the Gulf of Mexico oil spill with two other such disasters, if you may. One was the oil spill from the Exxon Valdez um, uh, oil tanker that was in Alaska in March 24th, 1989. Vavani has already alluded to that. And an oil spill uh, from the cargo ship MSC Chitra, about 10 kilometers off Mumbai Harbor in India, in August 6, 2010. And um, I'm just going to... How do I make this work? Do I just... Which one is yours? This one. This. And there we go. Slideshow. Thank you. Oops. Perhaps. Slideshow. Thank you. Now. I think we've got to get some extra minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, I'm talking about this three, three uh, events taking place in different points in time, uh, different places, and yet connected by some sort of a risk, which is um, apparent when we talk about this event. Uh, the um, Exxon uh, Valdez um, uh, spill in Alaska, 1989, Deepwater Horizon, Gulf of Mexico, and MSC Chitra, Mumbai. Interestingly, um, I have also been following uh, the media discussion on these things, and it's quite amazing to see that how uh, there has been uh, cross-references of all these things, how the BP uh, spill has been referred back um, to talk about the and vice versa, and that of um, MSC Chitra as well. So I'm just going to give you uh, the basic facts over here. Uh, this was the Valdez spill um, on March 24th, 1989, in Prince William Sound, the Exxon Valdez, an oil tanker bound for Long Beach, California, struck Prince William Sound's Bly Reef and spilled this very many number of barrels of oil, crude oil. Exxon Valdez oil spill is considered to be one of the most devastating, uh, devastating human-caused environmental disasters and was the largest ever spill in U.S. waters until the deep water oil spill. Now, this is something that I have really plucked from um, Wikipedia, I suppose. And so it goes back and forth, for the, uh, the references. Uh, and this is the deep water issue. On April 20th, 2010, a drilling rig explosion at Deepwater Horizon in Gulf of Mexico resulted in a spill that stemmed from a, a seafloor oil gusher. Uh, the uh, explosion killed people. And um, on September 19th, it was uh, considered to be effectively dead, um, invisible, going back to the metaphors that we have been talking about. Uh, no longer, uh, so it's as if we are going back to the point of normalcy. Um, and uh, in August 2010, in India this time, a container vessel while leaving the Mumbai port collided with an inbound uh, vessel and um, the, the ship, um, MSC Chitra, had a cargo of very many large numbers of uh, fuel um, and um, um, pesticides as well, and uh, the Chitra tilted sharply under the impact of the collision, resulting in the oil spill and splattering the containers of pesticides in the sea. Um, and I'm continuing uh, with the case of MSC Chitra in Mumbai. The worry is that there can be a bigger disaster waiting to happen if MSC Chitra cannot be refloated. This is a news article in August 9th. A ship that size can change the fish habitat, alter the topography of land nearby, and pause in the sea in the area for decades once it floods. It is apparent that there is every likelihood of their entry into the food chain, and that effects are long-lasting. So we are just not talking about chem um, uh, 
uh, affects lasting through chemical changes, but also biological changes and affecting um, the thing. But the interesting thing is this, uh, the report continues, the local people in the areas affected by um, oil spill feel that they could do with some boost, like an advertisement campaign and strong goodwill ambassador like the US President Barack Obama. And they're uh, quoting a local politician by saying that we also need such an ambassador to attract tourists and save our tourism industry, which is our only source of livelihood. So. Um, there are these moments of things getting out of hand, and then you need somebody to show that things are really hunky-dory, uh, a, a father figure, if you may, as, uh, somebody with whom you uh, tag your hope along, and uh, there is then order and control and hope and restoration things. Um, now, the interesting thing that I find in these three um, cases, if you may, and uh, this might be true for any number of such cases, is this, the issue of risk, uh, the risk arising from the common process in which men seek nature that which is useful and attempt to buffer that which is harmful. This um, essential contradiction uh, that uh, human beings would be having with the natural system. The human system of resource utilization often involve control and taming the environmental system. Even slight natural changes in the operation of this physical system can pose a risk to the mankind. And basically, um, this is going back to Vamani's point that um, fighting the known uh, evil with the unknown evil um, and how do you temper with um, a situation of dynamic stability and ensure that it really does not um, get completely out of hand and become a completely chaotic situation? Um, and all spills, um, especially that take place on water, these um, cases show that they have more common features than otherwise. Increased offshore drilling and transportation of fuel by tankers uh, across great distances had led to gradual increase in the number of in incidents over the years. So these are no, not so infrequent as one would like to assume. The odds of something going wrong have gone up because companies are venturing into more difficult areas to find oil. The big difference between spills that were in the past and now that a uh, major accident could cost billions of dollars to deal with. Um, and therefore, these risks are on the rise, not only in terms of the frequency of occurrences of the event, but also the cost if these things happen. Um, and this brings us back to the definition of risk. Distinction between reality and possibility, and this has to be acknowledged, and it is often associated with the probability of occurrence of uh, adverse effect. That is how one should be defining risk. And we find that this probability of occurrences of such infrequent but costly events are on the rise, together with the fact that the cost, if the events actually occur, if the um, possibilities turn into a reality, is also increasing. Um, but the problem is there are two different elements when we talk about risk. We talk about things uh, that are, can be calculated uh, in terms of probability and potential cost, the systemic risk, which can be deliberated upon. So these are the probability of undesirable occurrences that we can think about, and then we can choose to take such risky decision because probably the expected cost is outweighed by the expected benefit. But then again, we also have this non-systemic, completely random, idiosyncratic, accidental, capricious, erratic kind of risk, where you cannot even think about all the possible states of the world and try to figure out what would be the probability of occurrences of this thing. And uh, we find that it is this non-systemic risk that have been um, the feature of the disasters that I talked about, the three case studies that I'm talking about. I'm just going to give you an um, example. Look at the immediate causes of these disasters. Um, this is Exxon Valdez. The tanker would have never collided with the Bly Reef had the Rikers radar been looked at. But the radar was not turned on. In fact, the tanker's radar was left broken and disabled for more than a year before the disaster. And Exxon management knew it. It was just too expensive to fix and operate. So you just have the system, you ignore it, and then this thing happened. Completely idiosyncratic thing, right? I mean, um, in the case of deep water, uh, BP released findings from its own internal probe and that rig workers, um, the pressure data were ignored 
and the rig workers um, um, uh, were given the approval to continue drilling. And this kind of uh, brings us back to this issue of uh, what is the normal state of thing and to what extent shall we be accepting uh, risks, um, if at all. In the case of Apis uh, Chitra, it's even more funny. It's just a collision between a vessel because, uh, uh, because navigation rules were violated. Just a momentary occurrence, just a chance encounter of these factors which is going to leave uh, these effects and causes for a long period of time, and we do not even know how to calculate this kind of things. Now, the issue for us is really then um, about the distribution of risk. Who does the deliberation, uh, who does take the calculated risk, and who bears the cost of it? And so when we are talking about systemic risk, uh, when companies are actually calculating the numbers, depending upon their own cost-benefit calculations. They are also imposing this kind of an idiosyncratic risk on people who are either unwitting or unwilling participant of this event, um, almost passive participant of event, something that is forced upon you, not a matter of choice, but a matter of uh, compulsion. Um, so I, these are the points that I uh, want to raise and bring to your attention. Um, thank you very much. Carolyn Berman, faculty at New School for General Studies and chair of humanities there, will speak on the moral limits of trade and the petroleum frontier. In May, the New York Times reported that scientists are finding enormous oil plumes in the deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico, including one as large as 10 miles long, three miles wide, and 300 feet thick in spots. Maybe we should have the visual back. Um, there's a shocking amount of oil in the deep water relative to what you see in the surface water, said a researcher. The plumes are depleting the oxygen dissolved in the Gulf, worrying scientists who fear that the oxygen level could eventually fall so low as to kill off much of the sea life near the plumes. The undersea plumes may go a long way toward explaining the discrepancy between the flow estimates suggesting that must, much of the oil emerging from the well could be lingering far below sea surface. My, remark today, my remarks today address a question posed by Karen Quoney for this panel uh, and the pa panel committee. How have the images of the plume come to serve as a metaphor of the failures for, of both corporate responsibility and government regulation? But rather than focusing on the visual images of the event, I want to explore the poetic and mundane words that we use to invoke them. In particular, plume, spill, the corporate name BP, and the name of the exploded oil rig, Deepwater Horizon, as well as its owner, Transocean Limited. My goal is to find in these terms what the Caribbean writer Edouard Glissant has called a poetics of relation. We may thus begin with plume, that beautiful French name for showy feathers and quill pens, and actually the images of the oily bird and the plume may not be so separate, a boa of peacock vanity, which by extension has come to describe feather-like sprays, a mobile band of smoke, exhaust, blowing snow, and now underwater oil. A nightmare term, the gaudy show reveals its deadly counterpart as plumes of oil approach the New Orleans shore or linger far below, and the pride of custodians of advanced technologies who claim to make offshore oil drilling safe turns to mortification, forced to acknowledge billowing excrescences. If plume is a new addition to our vocabulary of catastrophe, oil spill is an outmoded phrase left over, or maybe not, maybe so outmoded, left over from the age of leaking boats, it is not quite appropriate for this disaster. It focuses attention on the wasted commodity, 200 million gallons of oil, rather than its violent eruption from the perforated ocean floor and the menace of its underwater presence. This violence is, of course, latent in the seascape, as Caribbean writers have long stressed. In 1943, for example, the poet Aimé Césaire described his native island, Martinique, as an extreme deceptive scar on the wound of the waters. 
a fragile thickness of earth already fated for a grandiose future, the volcanoes will explode, the naked water will bear away the ripe sun stains, and nothing will be left but a tepid bubbling pecked at by seabirds, interestingly, the beach of dreams and the insane awakening, unquote. The cataclysm foretold by geology gives us a lexicon for the current man-made disaster. To call the premature eruption of oil from the seafloor a spill is in this light a comic understatement. Yet the term spill does link the event to another catastrophic failure to contain, the flood caused by Hurricane Katrina. Both leaks have produced what Freud called a return of the repressed. If the sea is history as Derek Walcott has suggested, then the plumes in the Gulf of Mexico and the floods in New Orleans remind us of the long history of US imperialism and the slave trade in particular. Remember that one of the first achievements of the new United States was to acquire vast Western territories in the Louisiana Purchase. Western expansion fostered an interstate slave trade located in New Orleans. You might ask why I bring up US imperialism. Are we talking about British petroleum? The all too familiar foreign villains of our endlessly rehearsed national allegory once opposed by the patriotic Boston Tea Party. Yes and no. The phrase BP also requires some parsing. BP Limited started out as an old fashioned national imperial British company, the Anglo-Persian Oil Company in Iran in 1909. Forced to withdraw when the Iranian parliament nationalized its oil after World War II, it returned to Iran in the wake of a coup sponsored by the American CIA with support from the British government. British petroleum operated in Iran until the Islamic Revolution in 1979. In the 1980s and 90s, the British government sold its holdings as part of Thatcher's privatization strategy. The company expanded into the US and merged with Amoco in 1998 yet it continued to foster its national image in the UK, for example, by helping the Tate Modern British Art Museum launch an exhibit entitled Representing Britain. In 2001, it renamed itself BP with the tagline Beyond Petroleum and a new logo with a symbol patterned after the emblem of the Green Party of Canada. Its underwriting of art museums continues today with sponsored competitions in the National Portrait Gallery, as I noticed when I was in London. At the same time, it has been repeatedly cited for um, being one of the 10 worst corporations based on environmental and human rights records, etc. The name BP, in short, conjoins a long history of British and American corporate irresponsibility and government complicity, along with the dreams they have fostered. But what dreams have they fostered? One answer lies in the poetics of relation evoked by the name of the oil rig in question, the deep water horizon. To find a junction of earth and sky deep in the water is a beautiful dream, to be interpreted alongside the names of transocean and beyond petroleum. In the context of deep water oil exploration, these fantasies belong to a heavy concoction of risk, profit, and most of all adventure that I would call transoceanic venture capitalism. This is the dream of Daniel Defoe's 18th century novel, Robinson Crusoe, the tale of a shipwrecked Englishman long recommended as an educational text for modern boys, introducing them to the state of nature. Recent literary scholarship in oceanic studies has pointed out that though he looks quaint in his goatskins, Crusoe epitomizes experimentation at the limits, not a regression to a state of nature. Instead, the pristine state of nature fantasized by the Enlightenment turns out to be shot through with another concept of nature as a harsh but fertile zone to be plumbed through human inquiry and practice. All right, I'm going to skip to the end. I got into um, Robinson Crusoe's slave trading and why he sort of regrets it, but in the end gets all, all of his um, increasing estates and feels that the risks were all worth it. Um, Crusoe's tale, in effect, shows that shipwreck pirates and wild beasts are the only dangers to overseas business ventures. Despite these risks, there's absolutely nothing to fear from partners abroad and their potential bad faith. What's striking to me is the continuity between the literature of the slave trade and the contemporary poetics of transoceanic venture capitalism. 
We may thus have something to learn from the early anti-slavery reformers who sought to define the moral limits of commerce and to campaign against the transatlantic slave trade using all the powers of literature. As we sail toward the edges of a non-world, to use Glissant's phrase, we should be wary of our dreams and of our stock tickers and watch for the plumes of our own boundary crossing ventures. Uh, <clears throat> Dominique Petman, uh, faculty at Lyon College and chair of culture and media there. Who will speak about, sorry, uh, reaching a peak, sex, oil, and red tape. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. Um, my talk, or should I say talklet, uh, begins with an epigraph from Antonioni's La Ventura, which has the wonderful line, I don't know why, but I hate all comparisons involving oil. Peak oil warning bells uh, rang out in the 1950s from uh, Texan geoscientist M. King Hubbard. Peak libido warning bells, although the phrase was not used, um, were rung out in the 1960s by political philosopher Hubert Marcuse. An intriguing connection between these two forms of depletion, one of resources in the ecosystem, another of resources in the ego system and both impacting on the economy, since the economy itself is driven both by oil and libido. We could argue one fuels the other, or rather both have been the fuel of modernity and postmodernity. one material, the other intangible, but no less influential for that. In theory, libido, unlike oil, is a sustainable resource. It is not made from the compression of long dead biota, but from the repression of living impulsions in the interest of building culture, which according to Freud is the constructive task of Eros. According to French philosopher Bernard Stiegler, we should not confuse libido with mere sexual desire. Libido does not selfishly consume its object, but takes care of it. Libido is more about social compassion than primal passion. This latter is what he calls in his own idiosyncratic rendering of Freud, drive. So drive is just sheer blind drive, it's not libido. So to say the world today is overflowing with sex, but it has more or less run out of libido. And just as, the, just as the system will presumably violently collapse, or at least contract when we run out of petroleum products, so have the possibilities for true human interaction already evaporated, um, according to Stiegler. To put it in a nutshell, Mad Men and Mad Max are the twin mirrors reflecting back to us the dilemmas of peak oil and peak libido. They're both what's going to happen after. But there is a precursor, a short story written in 1928 by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle on the precipice of the Great Crash. Entitled When the World Screamed, this hyperbolically symbolic tale tells of a rogue scientist, probably the kind that re released dispersants today, Professor Challenger, who lives up to his name and throws down the gauntlet to nature herself. Convinced that the Earth is a living creature and thereby anticipating Lovelock's figure of Gaia, Challenger uses vast, boring equipment to effectively rape Mother Earth in a gynophobic, neo-Victorian Oedipal extravaganza until she literally screams and plumes um, fly out of the ground. Let us remember the 2008 Republican National Convention's frat house-style slogan, Drill Baby Drill. And let us also remember the Sex for Oil scandal concerning mining companies, license givers, and putative government watchdogs, first uh, uncovered by the press in 2008, but not reported widely till after the recent disaster. I would also further note that in the 1960s, one in 44 oil wells paid for themselves, and one in 1,000 made a good profit. The promise of profits alone is not enough to account for such a frenzy. A dark energy has been at work. Which brings us to the BP's Deepwater Horizon oil disaster, which occurred as if to literalize the convergence of these two peaks. Crude oil gushed out of the compromised wellhead for three months, releasing approximately five million barrels worth until it was finally sealed. For three months, while we all prayed for a solution, it certainly felt like one of those intensely symbolic zeitgeist-defining catastrophes. Not only a tragedy for many lives lost, human and animal, but also a palpable indictment of our way of life, our material dependencies, 
and our infinite capacity to take the world bequeathed to us um, by industrial capitalism for granted. It is, as if, it is as if Conan Doyle's professor and challenger had decided to deliberately cooperate with James Arnold Ross Jr., the protagonist of There Will Be Blood, and Hugh Hefner to illustrate the blind and relentless post-libidinal drive behind the increasingly penetrating search for oil, a drive which cannot be shut off much as we collectively will it so. I don't even know what that means, but I guess I should hurry up. Um, <laughs> the gusher in the Gulf of Mexico uh, was repeatedly referred to as a wound inflicted by the hubistic humans on the already battered Mother Earth. Um, and it is indeed difficult to resist the temptation to conflate oil with blood as we watch this subaquatic hemorrhage on live webcam. Right there in ominous silent pixels, we witness the horrifying return of the compressed, a severe, severed ge uh, geological jugular that seemed to stubbornly resist any technical tourniquet we could devise, pure id liquid. Yet we did finally staunch the flow thanks to the same kind of engineering expertise that got us into this mess in the first place. Today's technocratic challenges provided closure for the experiment of Doyle's story, blocking the eruption and sealing the flow with unholy quantities of concrete. And we are left to wonder what is more revealingly disturbing about our own hubris, the ability to make the world scream and bleed, or the ability to make it mute and bruised. The Deepwater Horizon disaster is the third installment in the spectacular trilogy, which will be known as this fall of the American empire, following on the heels of 9-11 and Katrina. 9-11 laid bare the fact that America was unprepared, politically and emotionally, to anticipate and deal with issues of foreign policy. Hurricane Katrina laid bare the fact that America was unprepared, politically and socially, to anticipate and deal with domestic issues of continuing economic and racial inequality. And Deepwater Horizon laid bare the fact that America is unprepared, politically, psychologically and culturally, to anticipate and deal with the very different economics of what we might call libidinal ecology. Just as the managers on BP's oil rig turned off the alarms so that they would not have their sleep disturbed, the world hits the snooze button for disaster after disaster, somehow reassured by a process actually called static kill. Shelley Fox, the Donna Karen Professor of Fashion at Parsons and the Director of the MFA in Fashion Design Society. Thank you. Um, when Karen asked me to uh, participate in this panel, I was um, she asked me to uh, kind of expand on the idea of, I mean, how as a fashion professor you respond to this kind of um, subject. So we talked about um, something that I wanted to just give you some ground um, background on a, on a project that I did that led me into this kind of thinking for the oil spill. So what does it mean to wear a uniform and what purpose does it serve? The, uh, an exhibition that called Workwear, so we're looking at the male, female, blue, white collar, professional and labor. Maybe these terms are outdated also. This led to an exhibition, which this section was called Office, which was developed around the idea of everyday work uniforms in New York City, taking the idea of the worker as an installation, the office, a table and a chair, the blue collar, white collar worker uniforms. Speedwack, a company, provided the uniforms and have been manufacturing in New York City since 1904. The manufacture of all the uniforms that we associate with the cities of America, from the MTA, medical, emergency, NYPD, fire, airport workers, etc. This led me on to the next idea around this particular exhibition for the idea of undercover. The work is the work of the sorry, is the workwear of the plain clothes cop that turns the subject of workwear and uniform on its head. The undercover installation was inspired by a conversation, an anonymous interview with an ex-undercover NYPD officer. The interview was centered around their everyday and the relationship to their undercover clothing, their habits, their essentials, their duties. Three ideas were presented around pockets, bright colored t-shirts, extra large shirts, plus belts and trainers. The audience was challenged to accept no limitations when it came to considering what it is and is not workwear. It is also provocative to put clothes that may seem devoid of any real design merit in front of an audience and force them to see their value at a real life ideas level. 
this was one of the sections also in the, in the workwear exhibition, which is the last section before I come to the oil spill. Uh, the mascots. The display offers an eyebrow-raising take on the theme of workwear. Its display of real mascot costumes from the iconic US brands such as Dunkin' Donuts, Hershey's, The Mets, Taco Bell, and Geico. The costumes displayed in this exhibition were presented as an extreme form of workwear, uniform. More than any other kind of uniform, they are embedded with aspects that are at the heart of the commercial success, product, marketing, sales, and branding. And these costumes do business by entirely immersing the worker, removing their identity completely, and creating a totally fictional role for them to play out, typically as fleeting moments of escapist gift-giving gift street theater. The presentation of mascot costumes in the exhibition asks us to think about what we mean by identity and uniform. And so what do we, what do we think about the idea of the uniforms and the identity of people that have been around with the, um, within the oil catastrophe. So we're looking at the corporates, the cleaners, the veterinary pathologists, the locals. How do we define them from each other in their clothing and authority? How do they set themselves apart through their uniforms? Here we have a press photographer who is getting a closer glimpse at the oil. Um, the government taking steps to investigate the cleaners, all varied in their uniform, some with more protection than others. Volunteers, contractors, what do we mean by being contracted? Extremes of protection on the beach. So again, looking at what is going on in this picture is very difficult to, to see at this point, but it, it says a big story. BT contractors with no breathing apparatus from the oil, the National Guard, the US Coast Guards, the Greenpeace marine biologists, the cleanup, the veterinary pathologists, the volunteers, and what they're wearing. And often I was looking at all the um, the research into, into what make, goes into making all of this rubber protection, clothing, all the uniforms that were made. And in fact, it's interesting because Spiwak's entire archive of all the uniforms that are produced in the whole of the USA for across all the American cities are actually based in Mississippi. Um, we have the volunteers and the wildlife specialists. And then we have the consequences, and I find this quite interesting from this image to the last image that I'm about to present, but also the consequences, the workers, the oyster workers in their own uniforms. The scene, and I kind of like this image because it's almost like the unseen, so looking at the micro, of now he can't, the damsel can't fly. Um, to the unforgotten, and then the uniforms of the unanswerable. And lastly, the hands on deck, the wearing of the hard hat in a situation that doesn't require it. Note the clean hat, unused, what was its purpose? So it's really not to be able to give you any answers around the uniforms, but it's clearly more of an examination of some of the things that we see every day on TV and what we gain from that. So I hope that was interesting. <laughs> That's Tony Hayward proving that uh, BP follows OSHA regulations. Okay, last uh, but certainly not least, we have a, a, a paired presentation, Elizabeth Ellsworth and Jamie Cruz of Smudge. Elizabeth is also Associate uh, Provost for Curriculum and Learning uh, at the Provost's Office and Faculty in Media Studies, and Jamie is a graduate of the Media Studies Program. Thank you. 
So the name of our presentation is Liquid Geologic Time. Our collaboration is called SMUDGE. Our work meets sites and moments where the geologic and the human converge. Tonight, we draw on recent field expeditions that we've taken as artists. We'll be using the concept of geologic time to trace connections among the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, underground nuclear testing in the American West, and the ongoing oil spill in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Our point tonight is this. Aesthetic response can play a vital role in meeting those places where the geologic and the human spill into one another. The Gulf of Mexico oil spill is a portal opened by humans into deep geologic time that we can't seem to close. The substance that is now spilled into our world was millions of years in the making. It's the transformed remains of animals and plants that lived in former worlds known to geologists as the tertiary, crustaceous, permian. The geologic materials that fuel and give form to our lifestyles are the products of monumentally slow, long, and powerful earth forces. When we extract them, we reach back into deep time and fold those forces into the present, often setting the stage for deep futures and for all humans to come. Deep ocean drilling isn't the first time humans have used technology to reach into a former world. We arrived at a meadow near Dulce, New Mexico. Hardly visible in the overgrowth was the monument. It marked the site where the Department of Interior, the Atomic Energy Commission, and the El Paso Natural Gas Company had collaborated to detonate a 20 ton, 29 kiloton bomb, twice as big as the one dropped on Hiroshima, at a depth of over 4,000 feet. It vaporized 90 million year old shale. The idea was to stimulate the flow of natural gas. According to the government, gas buggy worked, except it also made the natural gas too radioactive for human use. <laughs> Today, the nuclear contamination below the site remains. Government documents explain why. The Department of Energy does not plan to remove subsurface radioactive contamination in or around the test cavity because no feasible technology exists to do so. Like the Gulf oil spill, gas buggy opened a portal into geologic time that continues to spill into deep human futures. Less than four miles from this room in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, the second largest oil spill in US history continues to unfold. Up until the Gulf spill, it was the largest. 200 years worth of industrial byproduct are seeping into Newtown Creek and the adjacent groundwater. Over 1,500 homes sit above a toxic underground plume of 30 million gallons of oil. Last summer, BP and the EPA called upon the public for input on how to stop the Gulf spill and clean it up. What if they and all of us had called on artists to create image sensations and speculative objects designed to assist citizens policymakers, and corporations to feel the reality of geologic forces and materialities. Artist George Trekis was commissioned to design the so-called nature walk that exists today along the edge of Newtown Creek in Brooklyn. You can tour it as any other walk in the city, or you can choose to see the juxtapositions created by Trekis as an invitation to a different sort of tour. Trekkis offers a gradual slope of granite steps down to and then into the water. He has etched them with names of geologic epochs, Triassic, Carboniferous, Pleistocene. Following the steps and geologic time down to the edge of this creek, which is now a Superfund site, we found the artist had placed us in a stark encounter with the bare fact of this place. Only in the context of vast geologic time does the reality of the place snap into focus in the present tense. Here, as in the Gulf of Mexico, and as in the deserts of the West, humans have remixed the materialities of the planet, which took millennia to form. Our so-called technologies have rendered vast areas of the planet's surface and depth unlivable for humans and for increasing numbers of other living things now and into the deep geologic future. 
But that isn't and never will be the end of the story. 30 million gallons of oil plume beneath Trekkis' pathways, but the Earth's geoforces continue to play out here unimpeded. Over 1,000 nuclear bombs exploded in the American West, but the tectonic stretching of the Great Basin carries on unconstrained. 4.9 billion gallons of oil spilled into the Gulf, and the geologic interplays within this complex ocean basin persist unfazed. Trekkis' walk is an aesthetic prosthesis for sensing the stark realities of the human in the context of geologic time. It is a portal, not to other worlds, but to this one. <laughs>